sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. Ladies, I appreciate that. Amen. Good to have Brother Earl and Miss Marshall Green. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. He got me my first job in Greenville. Uh, they came to Kentucky right after I had surrendered to preach. I surrendered to preach on March 17, 1983, and we had a share a uh, There we had a 50,000 watt FM radio station that reached five different uh, states at a time of having to share a thon. First time I ever saw Brother Earl Green. And he said, I've got a brother in law that owns a tire shop, Main Street Tire Shop down in Anderson, South Carolina. And he got me a job, and I started uh, two stores and helped start a third store for him up in Greenville Taylors in Spartanburg over the years. Hey, Amen. Boy, what, what a thrill. Uh, at work, I got to lead over 40 people to Christ. Amen. Uh, while working on the automobiles, sometimes I'd have 45 minutes to an hour with them by myself and their brother. Hey, had a good time and got us through Bible college. But I appreciate him, Miss Marsha. Uh, he's my older brother in the Lord. You come on up here. I want to see an old man. He's long in the tooth. Amen. He's now 75 years old. Brother Jimmy Clark is turning 75 years old this, this month. And I'm still 74 until May. Ain't that a blessing? Amen. Old man, you're doing all right, brother? Uh, for an old man, yes, sir. All right, you got that thing turned on? Yes, sir. You ready to go? Amen. Preach to us, brother. Okay. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. There's a couple of things I want to say before I have you turn your Bibles. Tomorrow, 
and Tuesday, Dr. Ralph Sexton Jr. and Pastor Winston's parish are going to be in Washington, D.C. They have rented out of space that normally the networks rent out to broadcast during elections. They're going to use those two days to pray for America. Our country needs prayer. Our country is desperately in need of God's help and need to turn back to God. We turned our clocks back yesterday. We need to turn our nation back to God. So if you would like to use your YouTube, go to Ralph Sexton Ministries tomorrow around 1 o'clock and all day Tuesday. And churches like Temple Baptist are praying for those two days for America. I believe God can turn America around, but it's going to take God. Politicians are not going to do it. It's going to take the grace and power and wisdom of God. So if you'd like to, at the end of the service, I'd like to have a special time of prayer if we could. And I think that'd be good. Now I want to tell you something funny. And some of you may think this is not a funny joke, but I learned this from Tim Lee, a, a veteran who lost his legs in Vietnam years and years ago. He's now still, he's in his 70s, and he's preaching all across the country. He told this story. He said the Lord Jesus with his disciples were on their journeys, and they saw a man that was on the side weeping, and Jesus stopped and asked him, says, why are you weeping? And he looked at Jesus and said, I haven't walked one day of my life, and I would love to be able to walk. And Jesus touched him and healed him, and he got up walking. And he was one happy man, and the disciples were happy to see Jesus do this. And then they kept on walking in their journey and came to another person that was crying and seated. And Jesus stopped and says, why are you crying so much? He said, I've been blind all my life and I sure would love to be able to see something. And Jesus touched him and he received his sight and he was really, really happy. And then Jesus and his disciples go a little further and there's a man seated and crying his eyes out, harder than the other two, just crying and crying and crying. And Jesus says, what's wrong with you? He said, I'm a Baptist preacher. And Jesus sat down and cried with him. You think about it. Preachers do need our prayers as he emphasized so much in Sunday school. You ought to love your pastor, love his wife, pray for them faithfully, daily, as often as God puts them on your heart. I have a list of preachers I pray for on a daily basis. These men of God need our prayers. And if you'd like to have someone added to your prayer list, Put, put Marcia and our name down. We love to have your prayers. My wife teaches kindergarten in Tabernacle Christian School, and she's got a real burden right now for one of our students. And uh, so please pray with her about that situation. And I teach the ninth and 10th grade Bible, and I teach a little bit of history as well. And then I teach in Bible college on Monday nights, but I, I have a more night off for the Heaven's share so I get to hear some preaching tomorrow night. But anyway, I, we'd appreciate your prayers. Uh, we've been in the ministry over 50 years. In fact, we're going into our 51st year. I pastored about 48 of those years. And now we're just available as God opens doors. And we sure love your pastor, Brother Johnson, and his wife. They have been faithful prayer warriors and friends for many, many years. If you'll open your Bibles, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. If you have your Bible, say amen. amen. If you don't have your Bible, look at, look, look at a Bible with someone that's sitting next to you, if they have their Bibles. I want to preach today on what God's Word says about the home. The home across America is under attack. I mean, that's, the home is under attack. The world is out to do everything they can to rearrange and rename homes, rename what you are. And 
I mean, our world is in sad shape. So I want to try to help us today if you'll just listen to God's word from his, in chapter two of Mark, I want you to read with me verses, a couple of verses here. And he get in, again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noise that he was in the house. If you mark your Bibles, I would encourage you to underline it was noise. He, Jesus, God's only begotten son was in the house. Think about this. He was in the house. Someone invited Jesus into their home. Jesus came into their home. And while he's there, he's teaching and preaching the word of God. But something takes place. Something happens. There's noise up, up on the roof. Part of the roof is uncovered. And when the roof is uncovered, Jesus looks up and he sees the face, faces of four men. Four men that were carrying another man on his bed. That man was, had palsy, unable to walk. And so as Jesus in that house looked up and saw those four men, and so he saw the faith of four men, and those faith was in the Lord Jesus Christ, who somewhere, somehow, they had heard about Jesus, maybe had seen Jesus, but they had trusted Jesus, and they felt like their friend who was at palsy could be helped by the Lord Jesus. So they bring him. They couldn't get him in the door. They couldn't get him in the window because the place was just packed. But they did go up on the roof and let him down. And when Jesus saw their faith, he blessed their faith and gave that man his healing touch and, and soul saving salvation. And Jesus says, thy sins are forgiven. Of course, there was the critics there. There was the skeptics there. There was always those that want to question everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did. But our Lord and Savior says that you can know that the Son of Man had power to forgive sins, a saying to thee, arise and walk. And here's the miracle. God's Son touched that precious paralyzed man with his word, and he was healed rolled up his bed, put it over his shoulder, and leaped and jumped and hopped out the door of that house. And everybody was giving God the glory. And they were simply saying that they had never seen it on this fashion before. But notice, if you would please, that Jesus was in the house. Let me ask you a question. Where is Jesus in relation to your house? Where is he? Is he head of your home? Is he vital? Is he important? Is he loved? Is he honored? Is his word read? Is he prayed to? Turn now, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And as you turn to Luke chapter 8, I want you again to notice a very particular moment. In Luke chapter 8, there are several things that takes place. Jesus has wonderfully delivered a man from 2,000 demons. That man was gloriously, gloriously saved by the grace of God, found seated and clothed in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. And the people that had the hogs that had died because the demons went into them, they came out in groves to see what was said and what was done. And they asked Jesus to leave in verse 28 of chapter 8 of Luke. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought that he would, might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to thy, watch these words, thy own house. The people have asked Jesus to leave. But this man that was gloriously, wonderfully saved wants to go with Jesus. But Jesus says to him, return to thy own house. Your house needs to see what God has done for you. Your house needs to know that God has power to touch and transform 
the life of you and the life of your family. So he says, go to thy own house and show them great things God had done for thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus, God, had done unto him. Now, if you would look at verse 40. And it came to pass when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. To me, that's a precious thought that there are people that want to hear, want to see, and want to hear from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we rejoice in that, and they were waiting for him. And look at verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. We see in Mark chapter 2 and verse 1 that it was noise that Jesus was in the house and that great miracle. Now, here's a ruler of the synagogue, a very powerful man, a man that loved his family, a man that had heard about Jesus. He had either heard him, he definitely knew who he was because he came to him. And look what he asked Jesus. He says, and he besought him that he would come into his house. If you mark your Bibles, would you please underline that? He besought Jesus that he, Jesus, would come into his house. Now, Heavenly Father, every one of our homes, without exception, needs to have Jesus come to our house, come to our home, work that transforming miracle of salvation, work that miracle of grace and strength and help and love in these very difficult days here in America and around our sin-sick world. God, we pray that the Spirit of the living God would speak to every heart, and especially for those who have not yet trusted Christ, they would realize beyond any and all doubt if they died today, they would burn in hell forever and that the Lord Jesus can be their Savior if they would by faith trust Him and change their heart and change their home. So please, dear God, work that mighty miracle that only you can in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, as you read that part, he seeks Jesus and wants Jesus to come into his house. Now, watch why. For he had one da only daughter, one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went to the people, thronged, but as he went, the people thronged him. Jesus was asked by Jairus, to please come to my home. At my home, I have a 12-year-old daughter, my only girl, and she's dying. And Jesus went. Now watch. At this Jairus' invitation, Jesus goes to follow him to his house. Think about this. This man's heart is broken. His daughter is sick. She's so sick, they believe she's going to die. And he seeks out Jesus and he invites Jesus to his home. He feels like with all the people that's in the world, there's only one person that can change this event. And that was Jesus. And so Jesus begins to move with Jairus toward his home. Now, I want you to think about something. That girl is 12 years old, right at becoming a teenager. 12 means authority and power. And somehow or another, God has put on Jerry's heart to go to Jesus, ask him to his home, because he felt in his soul that he had the authority and the power to change his daughter's condition from being dying. As they travel, can you think about this? As they're traveling to Jerry's home, something happens. An event takes place. Jesus is surrounded left and right, front and back by people. But somewhere in the distance, there's a lady that's had an issue of blood for 12 years. And she's unspent everything she's had on doctors 
and they could do nothing for her. But she thought in her mind, I've heard about Jesus. He's here. If I can just get close to him and touch the hem of his garment, I can be healed of this blood issue. And so Jairus and Jesus and his disciples are all moving toward Jairus' home. But all of a sudden, Jesus stops. He stops. Virtue has been let out of his body. He knew someone touched him by faith. He knew that someone touched him that needed his attention without reservation. So Jesus slows down and stops. Now let's think for just a moment. They're going to Jairus' house at Jairus' invitation to try to work that miracle and succeed in that miracle of healing his child. But now, with time being the essence, they're stopped. Someone has touched Jesus. And Jesus says, who touched me? And we think about this wonderful story. He says, virtue's gone out. Peter says, how can you know somebody touched you? Look at everybody thronging around you. And so this lady who's been facing this dreaded disease for 12 years of time now comes up and says, Sir, Jesus, I have this blood disorder issue for 12 years. And I don't have any more money. It's all gone. The doctors has it. And I knew in my heart, if I could just touch your garment, that I could be healed. And I love what Jesus says to her, if you would, please. And let's look at this for just a moment. Look at verse 47. And when the woman saw that she could, was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. Remember, Jairus fell down before Jesus. Now she's falling down for Jesus after she's touched his garment. She declared to him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed. And what's the next word? Immediately. Immediately. And he says to her, now watch these words. And he said to her, daughter, would you circle that? Earlier we see where Jairus' daughter, little D, 12 years of age. But here's this lady with an infirmity of her flesh. And Jesus says, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith that made thee whole, go in peace. So this scene of Jairus going to his home has been slowed down. This woman has been miraculously and gloriously saved and, and freed from that blood issue. And then Jairus looks up and he sees folks that he knows and loves coming from his home. And while he yet spake, there had come with one from, his, from the ruler of the synagogue's house. Notice again the word house. Saying to him, thy daughter is dead. Trouble not thy master. Can you see for just a moment, Jairus? We hear no comments from him as Jesus stops. As Jesus heals this precious lady. There's no criticism. There's no questioning. There's no worrying. There's just looking at Jesus and knowing that Jesus is in control. He controlled that situation and he'll be in control of this one. But now he hears the word. Your daughter is dead. Can you hear that word? Those are some of the most saddest words a parent can ever hear about their child, about their loved one, about their friend. A dear friend of ours, he mentioned a while ago, Brother Jimmy Clark's brother, John, is right now in hospice house after suffering a major stroke where he cannot even swallow anything and is facing death. Jimmy's already buried his wife and buried another brother. Now he's facing the problem of burying this, this brother. But listen to me very carefully. I know there's a lot of movement, but please listen to me. 
Please listen. Jesus hears what that man said. Your daughter's dead. And they think now there's no need for the trouble him because he can't do nothing about her being dead. But Jesus heard it and answered him saying, they're standing still. This man has come and said, your daughter is dead. Maybe Jerry looks at Jesus and we don't know what he's thinking, but he came by faith and kneeled at Jesus' feet and invited him to his house. And now his house has been invaded by death. And Jesus says to him, Jairus, fear not. Fear not. O only believe. Here's the rule of the synagogue. Hearing the words of Jesus, fear not. Only believe. What tremendous comforting words from the lips of Jesus. And as he hears those words, he says, believe only. Look what else. Is. And when he came into the house, remember, Jairus invited him to his house. And now they journey can start and continues and they go into the house. And what do they see? Well, Jesus takes James and Peter and John, mom and dad's already there. The child's on her bed, dead, and there's Jesus. When you think about the folks that's there, five is the number of God's grace. And two, the daughter and Jesus, at seven, that's perfection. So here we see this 12-year-old child laying there silently, no word, no breath, She's died. Now, how long has she been dead? How long over long it was to take that gentleman to get to them to let her know that he was dead. She was dead. And now Jesus, with that few folks going to the house, the rest of them jeer and laugh and snicker. All they could do with Jesus because he says she was sleeping. And Jesus said to the, this, that uh, all wept and bewailed her. And he, and he said, weep not, she's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. There again is your criticism. There's your scoffers. There's your mockers. There's your evildoers, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all out and took her by the hand and called saying, made arise. This precious 12-year-old child laying there lifelessly, mom and dad weeping beyond your and our understanding to see their only child die. And as they're weeping, and Jesus reaches out and touches her hand and says, Maid, arise. And that precious child, watch what the Bible says. And so her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded her to eat meat. You know what I think? They probably gave her pizza. <laughs> of course, I'm having fun with that. But that child was brought back to life and he says, give her meat, give her something to eat. She needs nourishment, she needs strength, she needs vitamins, give her something to eat. But Jesus was invited to his house. Now that he's in his house, his house has been gloriously forever changed by the presence of the Lord Jesus and by God working a mighty miracle in the life of that 12 year old by the power and authority of God's son. So we see two wonderful occasions in Mark two, where he was noised, he was in the house and in Luke eight, where he was invited to Jairus's home. Those homes were gloriously transformed because of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ being involved in those homes. Now let me give you some other references. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 5, likewise grieve the church that is in their house. In 1 Corinthians 16, 15, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that the first uh, that is the first fruits of Achaia, they have been addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So here our Lord reminds us as the letters Paul writes to Romans 
And Paul writes to Corinthians that there's homes, homes, houses, where Jesus is first and foremost in those homes, where he's loved, he's honored, he's adored, and where they worship him as a family. And we praise God for that. But let me give you another lesson. Over in Acts chapter 10, there's a man of the Italian man, a very powerful man who fears God with all of his house. He fears God. He gives alms to many, many people. And as he gives alms to many people, and as he, as he thinks about God, and he wants to know more about God, God deals with his heart. God sends him a, an angelic messenger. And that messenger says to him, send a Joppa for one Simon who's called Peter. And he'll tell you what you need to know. I feel like with all my heart, this is mission calls. Missionaries go around the world because someone in that part of the world, they may fear God. They may know about God, but they don't know him personally. And so here's Cornelius with a God-fearing family and with a family that is very gracious and kind and benevolent, but yet they did not know God personally. And he wanted to know. So he sent messengers to, to Joppa to get Simon Peter. And God had dealt with Simon Peter that God is no respecter of persons. The gospel is to the Jew and also to the Greek, the Gentile. And as Peter got the message clear and plain from the Lord, and those men came to his house, he knew that God had sent them, because there was a family in their home, in their house, that needed to know the truth. And so Simon Peter goes, and he goes, and it says that he preached the word of God to him. Cornelius received the Lord Jesus Christ, his wife received the Lord Jesus Christ. His children received the Lord Jesus Christ. His servants received the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a glorious time of many, many people coming to know Christ as Savior because Simon Peter, he went in obedience to God's command and gave those people what they needed to know. And that's the truth, that Jesus saved sinners and God saved precious sinners there in the house of Cornelius, and we thank God for it. And as you think about this, God arranged Peter to go preach the gospel, and they heard the gospel, and those folks were gloriously, wonderfully saved by the grace of God. Then over in Acts chapter 16, there's a lady. Her name is Lydia. And the Bible says this, and when she was baptized, all because she was saved, and beloved, listen, baptism is a part of, not of salvation, it's a step of obedience after a person is saved. And so she was baptized, and watch, in her household, she besought us, saying, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house. So here's another home that's open to God's servants, that's open to Paul and Silas. She says, come into my house, and abide there, and she constrained them. So we find the Lord Jesus is working with that Italian bound in Cornelius' home, saved them. Now here's Lydia. She's been baptized because she's been saved now in her household, and she asked the preachers to come into their house. And beloved, listen, our homes ought to be a place where the preacher and his wife are welcome, where they can come in, sit down, have a Bible study, fellowship, drink a cup of coffee, or just be, be with you. Very important. So Acts teaches us very clearly about the importance of God being in the home. Then in Acts 16, Paul and Silas have been preaching the word of God. They've been arrested because they preach Christ. They were put in jail. And listen to Acts 16, 31, as God Taylor made an earthquake to shake that foundation of that jailhouse and all the doors opened, all the stocks was loose and the, and the jail, jailkeeper woke up 
and asked the question, what must I do to be saved? I wonder what Paul sung. I wonder what Silas sung. But they sung praises to God. They rejoiced in the midnight in that jail. Believe me, that was search, circumstances would be unbelievable. But yet these men of God, they looked beyond the circumstances and they worshiped and sung and gave praise to God. And the Spirit of God was speaking to all the prisoners. The Spirit of God was speaking to the, the jailkeeper. He comes in and says, Sir, what, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And that night, when they took Paul and Silas to his home, they were washed of the stripes. They baptized the believers. They fed them, they took care of them. And when he brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And beloved, that jailer, his family heard the gospel, were gloriously saved, and that jailhouse and this jailer's household became a born again believers because of the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, your home is vital. Your home is important. And may God help you to have a home where Christ is really your Lord and Savior and He's welcome in your home. You honor Him. You adore Him. You go to church to worship Him. And you're just so glad that God has worked a mighty miracle in your home. Listen to Psalm 122 and verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Also, if you notice, if you would, it's, it's a joy to come to the house of God. It's a joy to come into the house of God, shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck, and hear the good singing, like these young ladies that played and sung for us. What a joy and blessing that was. And we praise God for that. Amen. We praise God for that. So it's, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. And notice the gladness. And then listen to Psalm 84 and verse 10. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than the dwelling tents of wickedness. Beloved, you know what? If you're at the door to welcome people, thank God for that. If you, if you teach a Sunday school class, thank God for that. Whatever it is you do in church, if you're just a member, an active member, faithful member, dedicated member. Thank God for the house of the Lord that God's given you. Folks, God's given this church rich and bountiful blessings. Thank God for a long serving pastor who loves his Lord, who loves his word, who loves his family, who loves his church. Thank God for that. And thank the Lord for your ability to come to the house of God and rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than a and then dwell in tents of wickedness. And there's all kinds of tents of wickedness. You got, oh, you got your addiction crowd. You got your alcohol crowd. You got your immoral crowd. You got your ungodly crowd. But thank God we can come to a place, the house of God, and we can enjoy the goodness and blessings of our Father in heaven right here on earth. You see, there's safety, there's security, and there's satisfaction in the house of the Lord. And as Joshua said years and years ago, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let me give you one more illustration and we're almost through. In Luke chapter 19, verse 5 and 6, and when Jesus came to, this, to the place, he looked up and saw him, that is a man named Zacchaeus. And he said to Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must abide at thy house. So here's a tax player, tax collector, very greedy, very selfish, very indulgent. But yet he hears about Jesus. He wants to see Jesus. He's short of statue. He climbs up a sycamore tree. And as Jesus journeys, he comes to that sycamore tree. He knows Zacchaeus is up there. He calls him by name. It's like you call every one of us by name. He said, I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down. I love that. He made haste. He came down and received him joyfully. And Jesus said to him, This day is salvation 
come to his house, this house. For so as much, he's the son of Abraham. So these verses tell us very clearly the home is very important. The home is vital. Now I hope and pray that your home is a very special place. And I pray that Jesus is in, is in his rightful place in your home. Listen, let me kind of illustrate. And with this, I'll close. Over in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, there's an Old Testament prophet named Elisha. And in his journeys, there was a woman that noticed him as he would come by where she and her husband lived. And she knew he was a holy, listen, holy man of God. And after inviting him into the house and giving him a meal to eat, and every time he would come by, she would provide a meal for that preacher and his servant. And one occasion, she says to her husband, you know, we need to make room for this, this preacher. So on the wall of our house, let's build a chamber so when he comes through, we can feed him and he can rest. And she said this to her husband, let's put in that room a bed, a table, a stool, and a candlestick. She wanted a place for the man of God that would travel. And by the way, when you think about the Old and New Testament people, they traveled by foot. If you ever trace the feet of Jesus, how he journeyed like from Capernaum down to Jerusalem, those multiple miles over rough, rough terrain, mountains and valleys and streams and desert, the ruggedness of those days. Yeah, here's Elisha, rugged in his day. This lady had a burden for him to have a place where he could have a bed to rest. And beloved, listen, that bed speaks volumes that we truly can rest in our home or place that God provides, have that rest that we need. And then not only have a rest and a bed, but a table, a table for fellowship, a table where we can set the nutritious meals that own that we need, where we can talk and enjoy the blessings of God. And then a stool, a place where we can sit and meditate and read and study and pray. And a candlestick to remind us we need that light in that dark room, but we need to be light and salt in a dark world. When you think about your home, what kind of home do you have? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know beyond any and all doubt that you've been born again? Jesus told a very wise religious man, you must be born again. And beloved, from God's word and from our hearts, all of us must be born again. If we're not born again, we will spend eternity in a Christless place called hell. And God help every one of you. If you don't, if you don't know Christ, that you will trust him. And you that know him, make him welcome in your home. I mean, give him the front seat. Give him the best seat around the table. Make him welcome in the living room. And when you, when you go to bed at night, make sure he's the last one you talk to and the first one you talk to when you get up in the mornings. Yes, he was invited to Jairus' house. He was noised he was in the house. And I'll give you several verses of Bible about how important, how valuable your house is. I'd like to encourage every one of you that whether you're single, a widow, or a widower, or a family, I'd like to encourage you when we have the invitation for you to come gather with us around this altar and pray about your home. If you need to know Christ as your Savior, Pastor will take the Bible and show you from God's holy word how you can know beyond any all doubt you're saved. I encourage you. I'm going to have a prayer and maybe the pianist can come and play while I'm praying and just slip out and come gather on this altar. Then we'll have a special prayer led by the pastor for our nation. So let's all stand, please. Dear Father, we try to seek to obey your will in regard to the home. And God, our country, all across these 50 states, every home is under attack by Satan. 